Well, Carol, thank you so much for being here with me on the Entrepreneurial Success Podcast. I think it's the first time I'm having somebody with your expertise on the podcast. And I'm really thrilled to share that with everybody because I think you really have some great examples and tips that you're going to share with us here today. But before we get started, why don't I hand over to you to introduce yourself to the audience and tell us what you do. Thank you, Henriette. I'm so excited to be here and really grateful that you've asked me to be part of your podcast. Um, so my name's Carol Hansen and I inspire women who have wardrobe full of clothes but nothing to wear. And yeah, I know most women nod along or say, hey, that's me. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm raising my hand. <laughs> Particularly after the last 14 months or so, I think we all feel a little bit that way, don't we? Yeah. Um, yeah. But seriously, I'm an image consultant. And so I help women to look and feel fabulous every time they get dressed. And um, I also I'm an image con image consultant with a conscience. And why, by that, I mean that um, my primary point of taking a woman shopping is in her own wardrobe, because I've got this belief that most of us do have too many clothes. And rather than connect with what we've got, if we've got an event or something coming up, we think, oh, I've got to go out and buy something new. I need a new outfit. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of women are shaking their heads right now along with me. <laughs> <laughs> nodding, I hope, rather than shaking. But no, yeah, <laughs> nodding, nodding. Sorry, I'm saying shaking because I am doing this. Um, so tell me a little bit about how you got started. Um, how did this kind of evolve as well into where you are now? So I've been running the business now for six years and um, it started on the back of a less successful business because let's face it, sometimes we start doing something um, for ourselves and it isn't always the right thing and it, it evolves and takes time. So in 2013, with no experience in fashion, e-commerce or marketing, I went out and bought an existing online boutique that was for sale. How hard could it be? Well, very, as I found out, to get that stock turn right, to get the marketing right, the e-commerce right, etc. And as I was building my brand um, and the business up, I was doing a lot of um, talking to people online and probably more specifically at that time offline as well, um, running different events, attending different events. Um, and there were some common themes coming out and, and very much around women saying to me that clothes weren't made for them and they didn't know, you know, nothing was made for them. They couldn't find anything they liked and nobody designed for them um, in their sort of price points. And it just, you know, they, they were totally fed up with clothes. They didn't like shopping. OK, some of it was buying objections, of course, because there was me selling clothes. But I felt there was something more to it with those conversations. And I started to do a bit of digging. And the digging that I did was about body confidence. Mm -hmm. And the figures really surprised me because about 90 percent of women suffer from some kind of body confidence issues. That's a horrendous amount, isn't it? Yeah. Now, that may be just simply, you know, not feeling great on a, on a particular day, maybe feeling a bit bloated, just uncomfortable, not feeling like when you look in the mirror that you just you, you don't give yourself that wow or big high five um, right through to full blown body dysmorphia that so many of us um, do suffer from from sort of very minor to quite major concerns and um, eating disorders as well, where you've got a totally wrong perception of what you look like and that really resonated with me because I'd had an eating disorder suffer from an eating disorder for about 23 years from the age of about 17 through to 40 well past it by the time I was running the boutique um, and to be frank I couldn't have been in the clothes I don't think I could have been in the clothing business when I was suffering from an eating disorder I think it, there would have been far too many triggers going on mm. um, and it then occurred to me that if I could do something to help women feel better about themselves and to realize that they weren't what they saw in the mirror, that they were what everybody else saw in the mirror, because we have this different perception, then that to me is success. And so that's why I then trained as an image consultant and um, the boutique was a big expensive mistake, went by the by, that's fine. Um, but it got me focused and it got me passionate. And I really love that whole 
ethos of being able to turn someone's head and make them realize that they are gorgeous and they can give themselves that big high five when they look in the mirror it's it's just amazing yeah and it just doesn't it's not just a case of looking good it's a case of feeling good as well and when we feel confident we're so much more empowered it's not vanity at all it, it helps other parts of their lives and some clients have given me have told me afterwards that that it's actually transformed their lives and they've actually seen their business grow um, as a result of working with me because they feel much more confident and they can become more visible yeah i love your story and i also love the fact you said that you um you bought a business and you thought this is it i'm going to do it and you said it's a mistake, but I don't think it's a mistake. I think it's just a learning curve. It's something that you had to do, which brought you onto this journey where you are now. And like you said last time, the first time you and I spoke, you said you learn a lot of hard lessons, but it is good lessons because it kind of led you to where you are now. And it made you so much wiser for yeah. taking on certain things and making certain decisions now in your business. Yeah, you're so, um, I love your story. You're right. Uh, you're right and um i i just think that the i suppose the it was a mistake is is the i didn't really need to spend that much money to <laughs> those lessons <laughs> and i cringe now when i think about it but but you're right it, i i don't think i would be where i am now um and i certainly wouldn't have had the opportunities i had of um, doing things like speaking on stage at olympia during pure fashion which is the biggest fashion trade show um i wouldn't have met some of the people that i've met through through running the boutique mm -hmm. uh, if i hadn't had that experience so yeah i don't regret it i just yeah it was a mistake but it was it was part of the journey yeah, no, I love your story, honestly. Let's talk a little bit about the confidence because I think this is something that really reflects a lot on each and every one of us. And I mean, I'm even personally myself, you know, when I was younger, I was skinny. <laughs> and then as I got older, I always joke and say, it looks like I started swallowing a, a bowling ball and it just ended up sitting in the middle. And then after a while, it looks like I ended up swallowing a, um, uh, what do you call it, an exercise ball. So rather than using it, I swallowed it. And I mentioned it to my husband one day and he looked at me and he's like, oh, come on, don't over exaggerate. You're not fat. But that is kind of like the joke I make. But that's what I'm telling myself, even though I know I'm exaggerating. But yeah. I mean, if I'm telling myself that story, I know I'm not the only one. So many other women are telling themselves stories of how they perceive themselves, yeah. which is knocking their confidence. Yeah. And you, what in my experience and with the clients that I work with, that happens a lot when women start to go through um, the, the perimenopause and menopause as well, because there's so much comes up around that time in terms of questioning um, our identities, um, in terms of you know, our bodies not being the same as they were. As you said, you know, you exaggerate, but yeah, our body shape does change as we get older and you can have a great diet and you can do lots of exercise, but it won't always have that much of an impact. Um, and various health conditions may also you know, have an impact on your body shape. You can do nothing whatsoever about. So that self-acceptance is really, really important. And it's something we do struggle with. I mean, one of the things that I do when I work with my clients is one of the places we start is, and one of the first questions I ask them is, what parts of your body do you love? Mm. And that throws so many women um, in terms of, well, hang on I'm too used to telling everybody what I don't like about myself and what doesn't work and I was working with a client earlier this week and she was telling me about oh she didn't like her hips or her thighs or whatever and I stopped her and said look hang on um, what parts of your body do you love let's forget about the negativity and she said well I like the fact that you've pointed out to me that I've got a waist which I didn't think I had um, and I love my knees so great well, let's look work on how we focus on your waist and showing your waist off and your knees off. Then we can hide the bits you're not so keen on. So it's, it's starting from that position of love and that helps with the whole confidence thing. Mm. But the other thing that we do as women, apart from running ourselves down and talking to ourselves in a way that we would never talk to anybody else, um, <laughs> is that we, um, a lot of us suffer from comparisonitis. 
Yes. Um, and we start comparing ourselves to other people, whether that be, um, you know, our peers, whether that be people that we see, you know, celebrities, um, people in the media or just whatever we see on social media, which has so many advantages, but also has some major disadvantages. Um, and then we start, we find ourselves lacking. And when we start on that trail, it, seems to be very much a downward spiral and what we need to remember is to focus on the one person we do have an influence on us um and one person that we can make look beautiful us and forget about everybody else but it's a hard mindset shift to, yeah. to make um but the other thing to really remember is that whatever we are seeing on, in the digital world or on, in print world, it's just a snapshot of someone's lives. You know, I've I've worked with models that when I've seen them, when they come into a studio, you would never believe that they would look amazing on camera. And they do because they've got the right bone structure and stuff, but they don't, you know, they have they are enhanced with the makeup, the hair It's not all natural um and the way that they hold themselves and we need to remember that you know what we see in print and, and online is so superficial it's not the real world yeah yeah and i think it's so important because you know even in business i find so many of my clients and people that i tend to meet they talk to me about comparing themselves all yeah. the time and I'm thinking, fortunately, with technology as magnificent and amazing as it is these days for all of us, um, the downside is that we have access to so much yeah. where we constantly compare ourselves to other people. Yeah. And I think visually, that is one of the big stumbling blocks because we see other people look amazing and we go, oh, I wish I could look like that. Yeah. And then you start comparing yourself and that's where you're saying you're coming from a place of lack. Yes. And when you come from a place of lag, it is a downward spiral. Yeah, it because is. Because then you start the negative self-talk. Then you start looking at more what other people are doing and how yeah. they are looking. Yeah. Um, and let's face it. I mean, the other day, I'm, I'm just going to use a silly example here. I, um, I'm looking for some dresses. So obviously with technology, cookies, as yeah. soon as I go on Instagram, all of these ads are being thrown out to me about dresses. Yeah. And I saw this one woman and she had this beautiful dress on. And I was like, oh, such a good dress, but you need to be skinny in order to fit in this dress because of yeah. the shape of it. Yeah. And she was skinny and she looked beautiful in it. And I was like, mm, maybe not the dress for me. You need to be skinny. And then as soon as I thought that, I was like, whoa, 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 hold on a minute. I could rock that dress. <laughs> Why do I need to be skinny and perfect like she is in order to show off that dress? I could actually really look good in that dress. Yeah. Well, I didn't go and buy it in myself. Uh, the dress but that kind of mindset that I had on that was immediately like whoa what am I telling myself here yeah. but unfortunately a lot of other people just go like yeah I'm, I'm not skinny good. enough no and again the same client I was working with this week she I gave her some examples of dresses and things like that that would work for her and she looked at this one dress and she, oh my god that's beautiful and I tend to if I'm taking uh, if I'm extracting images for to show someone I tend to normally go with the ones that are without are not got a model wearing them so they're just the just the item um but this one did and she said but that's never going to work for me because look at her figure and I said no, I appreciate what you're saying, but the style is exactly right for you and you can carry that off because it's everything we've been talking about in terms of styles that will work for you. Just ignore the fact that there is a particularly slender model um, wearing it because but it's a, such a hard mindset because we yeah. get this. Of course, that's what the brands want us to see in that sense, because it's aspirational, isn't it? And mm -hmm. it's going to sell more clothes. Um, you know, I, I'm glad that we've made much more of a move towards um, getting more um, diversity on the catwalk and diversity within um, when you look on websites. But the diversity is much more about ethnicity than it is about different body shapes. Yes, you'll have a curvy model on there, but not necessarily truly representative of, of all the different body shapes there are out there. And yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And I heard some other news this week that really, really upset me is that apparently um, Instagram are planning um, an under 13 app. Oh, wow. Okay. I didn't know about that. <laughs> 
And that to me is just that to me is just going to push the barrier down much lower through the age groups mm -hmm. as to um, kids starting to get more aware about their body shapes. And it's already uh, very dangerous in young ages. Mm -hmm. Let's not drop it any further. Can we please let children be children? Yes, I agree with you. The other thing I wanted to mention is, as you were saying that, it's um, it comes back down to just the knowledge at the end of the day. Yeah. Because if you, it's like anything, if you want to get better at something, you go and get the knowledge of yeah. how to get better at it. If you want to enhance a skill, you go and figure out what do you need to do to enhance that skill. So it's like anything else. And I think this is the problem because we compare ourselves so much. We don't think of it differently as if, okay, so this is who I am. What do I need to find out about myself in order to go and look at what dresses I can wear? And this is where you come in. Yeah. You can help identify that body shape. Like yeah. I said, what parts of your body do you love? Yeah. What is the color? What is your face shape? All of those things that you can Sorry. do, which is going to build your confidence. It's yeah. going to make you feel good. And that is going to help you entirely just to start sparkling without the idea of I need to be skinny before yeah. I can go and get my wardrobe redone. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. That knowledge is power and understanding what works for you and what to leave on the shelves or, um, you know, and not to click on on the internet is really, you know, is really key. Colour is so important as well because it can make such an amazing difference. And colour is the first thing that we see and it's the last thing we remember as well. So if you get the right colours and you look incredibly healthy and glowing, then you can kind of get away with clothes that don't look 100% on you. But the colour is so important as well. And we have something in, um, in styling called the halo of colour. So if you wear the right colours, someone looking at you want, will look directly into your eyes because they're engaging with the whole person. It's quite holistic. Mm -hmm. Wear the wrong colours and they're distracted by what you're wearing. They don't necessarily know it's anything to do with the colours. It's just because they instinctively, you look a lot healthier. They want to engage with you. And if you wear the wrong colours, you can look ill, you can look pale, drawn, colours can overwhelm you or you overwhelm the colours. You can think about some people who've got very strong colouring who wear pastel colours. They just absolutely overwhelm it. So yeah, colour colour is key. And then as you said, knowing your body shape and understanding how it works and what clothing works for you and doesn't is just so super powerful. Yeah. Yeah. So at the end of the day, you know, whatever stage you're right in now in your life, if you're not feeling confident with your wardrobe, with your clothes, and you feel you need to go buy more clothes in order to get better or feel better, uh, you know, or, or even build your confidence, it's not going to happen. My yeah. suggestion is just go and figure out, you know, get in contact with Carol, figure out what your body shape is, what is your face shape, what are the colors that you need, and just by having that additional little bit of knowledge, seeing what works for you, what goes with you, what doesn't go, with, oh my gosh. You can do so much. You can actually start having fun with it. You can play with it. Yeah. And I think part of, part of what holds women back is, is kind of, we should know this stuff. Mm. And we feel we've got, you know, as women, um, you know, we've had mums, we've had sisters, we've had friends. We should have learnt it all from them. And, you know, why, we, why do we need to get expert views on it? It's not like, you know, if you go and start a new skill, if you learn to to paint for example then yeah you might have to go and learn how to paint with an art tutor or go and read books or video tutorials or whatever but we have this kind of innate feeling of i should know this stuff mm -hmm. yeah so there's a mindset change obviously needed there too to get over the kind of the should <laughs> Absolutely. You know, and such, such a negative word, isn't it? And such an, a, neg a negative emotional feeling and everything. Yeah. <laughs> no, honestly, it's, it's just go and just get in contact with Carol and just get it to help you. I mean, I promise you, you're going to feel so much better just knowing and having that knowledge. It's just going to help you. But I think equally that kind of segues very nicely into sustainability yeah. because this is where people go like, okay, so I know what my body shape is and I know what my color is and blah, blah, blah. Now I can go and buy the clothes mm. of what I need, mm. but it's not always about going and buying the clothes. And you spoke about 
going into your wardrobe and seeing what you already have. So talk to us a little bit about sustainability because you last time or the first time I heard you talk, actually you had some amazing facts that you brought out. And I was just like, what? <laughs> I wasn't even aware of that. Yeah. I think, I think that, was, that was just before Earth Day when you first heard me speak. And we were talking about the, or I was talking about the amount of clothes that get thrown away yes. and end up in landfill. And it is horrific. I mean, one truck per second gets sent to landfill that's full of textiles. Um, and three out of four items of clothing end up in landfill. Now, you may turn around to me and say, but Carol, I always donate my clothes to charity. And so many of us kind of think that we're passing, passing that problem on. We're not even, you know, we're not creating a problem. Um, and sadly, what charity shops can sell is a very small percentage of what we donate because we have got into this culture of, even if it's not true fast fashion, cheap fashion, that is not sustainable in so many ways, but in the, from a consumer's point of view, doesn't last and is cheap and is available. So we end up getting in the trap. As you said, you start searching for something on Instagram or on, on the web generally, and it follows you around, doesn't it? And, and it's that very um, subliminal marketing messages that are coming in there and encouraging you to buy. And that's in fueled our consumption, consumptive behavior from that point of view. And we create a massive, massive problem. Fashion is the second worst polluting industry in, in the world. Wow. Um, and that is behind um, the oil and airline industry. Um, and it, the waste and the damage that we're doing is right from growing cotton um, or manufacturing man-made fabrics, which of course involve oil, right through to when we when clothes end up in, in landfill. And just to come back to that point, because people may be asking, well, hang on, I do donate my clothes, so why are they ending up in landfill? There is just too much clothes that are sent to charity shops or donated. And um, so those that aren't sold through charity shops. And would you like to take a guess at the figure of what isn't sold in terms of percentages? Oh, my God, I'm too scared to guess. But go on, tell us. 80%. Oh, wow. Isn't so awesome. 80% of clothes donated is not sold through charity shops. So those end up on Unsold landfill? Stuff. Well, not necessarily in this country. And that makes it, even, in, in some senses, makes me feel even more guilty about it because... Um, what happens is the charity shop sell um, the stock doesn't get sold through because they can't keep it forever. They can only keep it for a short period of time. Um, they sell it off to wholesalers who deal in um, secondhand clothes. Some of it does get used and utilised and recycled into um, insulation and other types of usable um, uh, products. A lot is sent overseas, and that is now stopping now. Um, this is to sub-Saharan countries, um, where it's basically sold as second-hand clothing through their markets. And, second -hand, and those sub-Saharan countries are now turning around and saying, uh-uh, sorry, we don't want your rubbish anymore, or we can't deal with all your rubbish. And part of the problem is it's displacing their own local industries and employment because mm -hmm. they're getting all this stuff from the West. And you'll, you'll often see, won't you, on the news or documentaries of kids in sort of very rural parts of Africa walking around in what looks like sort of Nike or Adidas T-shirts or something like that. And I'm not picking on those two brands particularly, but that will have very often come through those secondhand markets. It's not that they've got the money to go out and buy um, those products that, or they're even necessary the knockoff products that may be made locally. So, yeah, we're just passing our problem off. Yeah. And the keeps doing that. And when those countries can't sell the products on, what are they supposed to do with it? That's how it can end up in landfill and not even on our own shores. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. It's, it's phenomenal to hear because we don't think about these things. You know, we just, I mean, silly example, but today was rubbish day for me. So all I had to do was just take the rubbish bags, leave it out front, and the council will come and collect the rubbish. But what happens thereafter? Yes, it goes to landfill, but where? 
what happens mm -hmm. to it. And I, and I think it's yeah. just one of those things. We just need to be a little bit more aware of what we're doing. And in yeah. particular, when it comes to clothes, because let's face it, ladies, we love a big wardrobe. OK, we love buying clothes and we love buying all those accessories. But I think if we just become a little bit more aware ourselves as to mm -hmm. what happened to the things we throw away yeah. and, you know, we, we might think twice before just buying a new pair of shoes or buying another top or buying another pair of jeans again. Yeah. And just looking at what we already have and just utilizing it I, better. I absolutely agree. And, it, you know, it's one of the things I teach my clients to do is how to maximize what they've got. And people are always surprised with how many outfits they can just create from, say, for example, a T-shirt and jeans by just adding a couple of different accessories and things like that. If you can just buy mixing and matching like that, you just create a totally different looks so easily. Mm -hmm. And we we just don't think outside the box you know we we run such busy lives or lead such busy lives um and certainly pre you know march 2020 that we just didn't spend the time thinking or stopping and thinking now i'm i am hoping that one of the good things that is going to come out of um, the pandemic is that i think a lot of us having been stuck at home are becoming a bit more aware of what that we don't need so much stuff yeah. And um, I'm hoping that that's also going to continue to mean our clothes, although I've, I've, I've got some question marks about whether it will, because we're starting to come out of lockdown now and we're going to start socialising more. And gosh, we might even be able to go on holiday to a few more countries as well soon. Um, so it's going to be very interesting to see what happens. But at the same time, while this has been going on, the whole thing about information about sustainability has been has been building mm -hmm. um and of course we've got the big conference in glasgow in um in november cop 26 which will give more info but if people want to learn and sort of and i'm, I'm not trying to frighten people here but i do think we need to educate we have a duty to educate ourselves and or responsibility if you like to educate ourselves go to bbc sounds and pick up the show, um, the podcast Costing the Earth. And um, there are, you know, there's different things about sort of environment and stuff like that. But one show I was listening to yesterday was talking about the landfill sites, particularly around the UK and the different moves, movements that there are now to look at that, because it was only really in the 1970s that we started waking up to the fact that we, you know, we couldn't keep doing it but mm -hmm. we've been doing it for an awful long time yeah. but this isn't just our generation our generation if you like gets blamed for an awful lot of it because we've you know we were the real consumer generation that grew up with the concept of um fast fashion it came into our lives um i don't know whether you know the the sort of the story of how that evolved or not but in the 1980s um there's no sort of clear definition you can't say this is absolutely when it happened but, but a big boost to the fast fashion industry was in the 1980s when zara went to new york and um they turned around to people they were opening up the store in new york and said we can get products from um design to shelves um, in our stores in two weeks and the american market went Wah. so there we went from two collections a year, which was the traditional sort of model for fashion, wasn't it? The autumn, winter, the spring, summer, through to 50 collections That's incredible. I never knew that story. Yeah. And that's it. That was the start of it. It was, it was the real, it was the kickstart of it. Okay, other people were starting to do it at the same time, but Zara or Inditex is the Spanish company that owns, mm -hmm. the big corporation that owns Zara, are credited if you like i'm not sure it's a credit i'd want on my name um <laughs> with, with kind of being one of the pioneer the major pioneer in terms of fast fashion because once they started everybody started jumping on the bandwagon that's incredible yeah oh my gosh just this whole conversation i just felt was so so interesting and and your knowledge to everything you know it's so inspiring to to listen to you talking about confidence and I'm sure everybody else has listened to this going like, yeah, yeah, why do I compare myself? I need to look more at what I love. So for everybody listening, you know, just go and look at yourself in the mirror and go, what do I love about myself? And just 
pick up the stuff that you love and concentrate on those. And if you actually want some extra help, just, you know, get in contact with Carol so she can help you out and, um, and go through that process of just identifying and gaining your knowledge of what you really need to do. But equally, build your own awareness when it comes to sustainability and comes to your wardrobe. What are you throwing away? Look at what you have and then decide, hey, I need to utilize this better. Yeah. And then at the same time, get Carol in to come and help you with your wardrobe to kind of look at all, um, all the aspects of, you know, there's so much you can do really with yeah. a couple of things. You don't need to go and buy a whole shop <laughs> in oh, order to feel you've got everything and you can use everything. That's not the case. No, you don't. And very often you have got an instinct of what works and what doesn't work. It's just that I think that very often we just get caught up in this whole cycle of we might go out and impulse buy um, a dress, for example, and not really think about how we're going to wear it. I mean, one of my golden rules when you go shopping and this applies online or offline is think, stop, think what how are you going to wear it what are you going to wear it with that you've already got in your wardrobe particularly if you're buying sale items you think oh god this is such a bargain well if you go go and buy a new pair of shoes and um, a new bag and some new jewelry to make it work it doesn't become much of a bargain does it so think mm -hmm. about that and also think about how you could wear that item three different ways because that's and what i also say is particularly if you're looking online put it in your basket and leave it at least 24 hours don't mm -hmm. buy it and That's then come a good back tip. then come back to it and see whether you still really love it because you can get swept up in that moment can't yeah. you of i've got to have this i've got to have this and um you know i i try to do that and in fact i went back on a site that I hadn't been on for a while and realized i got several things in my basket that have been there for months so it just shows that i wasn't really that impressed with them yeah no but i like that because that's a great tip you know put it in your basket online and just leave it there for 24 hours but don't put it in there if you don't feel you can use it three different ways yeah so if you can utilize that three different ways then going yeah that's a good option put it in the basket leave it there for 24 hours and then come back and go does this still ring true to you <laughs> absolutely and do and the other big question of course is do you really love it you know is it or is it kind of just making do because so many of us shop online and we end up keeping stuff because we can't be bothered to return it or it feels you know it feels like a faff to return it yeah and um when in fact if we'd thought about it and spent that time and just given ourselves that break, we probably wouldn't have bought it in, in the first place. Yeah, exactly. Oh my gosh, Carol, thank you so much. Before we head off and conclude with everything, you've got a fantastic freebie available for everybody. And this is your 14 day wardrobe planner. And I think this is going to come in very handy, specifically after this conversation we had today. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about this planner? Yeah, sure. So the 14 day wardrobe planner gets you thinking about several things. It gets you thinking, first of all, about how you want to show up and then putting together a short wardrobe plan. You say capsule wardrobe to a lot of people and they go, oh, God, that feels too scary. It feels too restrictive. But if you just start with a 14 day planner, then what you're effectively doing is thinking about your activities for the next 14 days, thinking about what the weather might be like for the next 14 days. So you might not have it all mapped out you know, 100%. And then you start making a list of the types of outfits you might want to wear. And if you do it properly, you'd spend some time doing it at the weekend and you plan it out and you might even photograph those um, those outfits when you put them together. So you remember them and you put it together in the planner and then you say, right, okay, brilliant. Now I know what I'm wearing for the next 14 days and I'm not going to get that going to your wardrobe and going, I haven't got anything to wear feeling because you've got it all mapped out. It takes away so much stress. And, you know, we're recording this in Mental Health Awareness Week. You know, I think every week should be Mental Health Awareness Week, personally. But, um, but again, if you can do something to relieve your stress, particularly first thing in the morning when you maybe have several things going on at the same time and you've got your wardrobe planned out, how much easier does it make that start to your day? Yeah. Oh my gosh. So, so much easier because you didn't have to think twice about it. You've already got it there and you just go get dressed and it's done and you feel great. You look great. Yep. That's it. All yep. sorted. 
Thank yep. you so much for making that available. I think it's amazing. I'm going to go and download my own copy. Yes. So for those of you <laughs> listening, if you want the 14-day uh, wardrobe planner, the link will be at the bottom in my show notes. And in included to that, we're also going to put we're also going to put all um, Carol's details in the show notes, so you can go and connect with her. So if you do need her help, you know, just get in touch with her via social media links, via her website. Everything will be there. But just get in touch with her and have a chat. And I'm sure she'd love to help you out if you've got any questions because let's face it you want to build your own confidence a little bit when it comes to your body and you want to feel great so why not just you know get some knowledge for yourself about who you are and how you could look like once you know what it is that you need to do in a nutshell so um yeah just go and contact carol and i'm sure she'd love to help you out i would absolutely love to help you out yes so download the planner come over and and meet me over on social and if you really want to get to know me on social then come and join my facebook group awesome women with style which will be in the show notes as well because that's where um we've got a fabulous community of just about 500 women where we talk about all things style on a daily basis brilliant thank you so much for making that available and it was so lovely to talk to you again and have this because i think oh my gosh you and i can talk about this forever (laughs) so no i just i just really enjoyed it thank you so much for your time and um we'll be in touch very soon again yeah thank thanks very much henry i really enjoyed being on on your podcast it's a brilliant podcast you're welcome thank you have a lovely day bye